Theodore's voice. Uh, you'll remember Moira a bit dusty in the tower, I've been in the tower uh, quite recently. Perhaps that's what it is. Anyway, I'm going to concentrate this afternoon on only two aspects of a much wider study of Mark Inch Parish Church. Uh, as Moira alluded to, work has been going on in this, uh, led by Mark Inch Heritage Group, but within the framework of the Living Lomans uh, Landscape Partnership, and with one or two experts, which I'll refer to later, of which uh, Moira is one. Um, Buildings archaeology, I've found, has been great fun, but very frustrating, because you think the answer is just underneath this piece of plaster, and if you just rip it off, there's the answer. And of course, you're in a living church, and it's very difficult to do that. Also, you need to approach the problem or problems from a number of different angles. Uh, archaeological, historical, um, uh, architectural in my case, and possibly also psychological as well, as we might, might see later on. First of all, I'd like to look at how the tower was constructed. Fortunately, it's largely intact, uh, apart from a couple of 18th century doors and a loss of decoration. And second, I would attempt a reconstruction of the nave and chancel that were largely destroyed after the Reformation and during the 19th century. This reconstruction by Bob Marshall illustrates both, both themes very well. Right button, good. Okay, the first thing that struck me about Mark Inch Tower is the incredible high quality, uh, incredibly high quality of the building. The stonework of the tower is very precise. And it would have once been uh, the tower itself circled by a double frieze of chip cut lozenges or diamonds that would have continued around the nave. Why such quality and why in Mark Inch? First, a quick bit of historical background. When Edward I's French speaking chronicler uh, passed through Mark Inch in 1296, he wrote that there were only three stone houses and the Moustier, or Minster. He had thought at that time that the uh, church was originally belonging to the Priory of St. Andrews. Uh, and in fact, that um, misapprehension has continued until the present time. I will argue, in fact, though, that it is, in fact, a family church of the Macduffs. It stands a few hundred yards from their seat of judgment at Dalginch in the heart of Fife and was gifted to the Priory in the late 1160s by two senior members of the Macduff family. It's therefore no ordinary parish church, and the Macduffs were certainly no ordinary family. They were descended from a royal lineage themselves, and they decided to throw in their lot with Malcolm and Margaret and their dynasty. That brought with it many privileges and responsibilities as lawmakers and uh, battle leaders, as well as a role in crowning the monarch. Although there is a record of a predecessor church around 1050, there is no record of who built this tower or when. It was granted to the priory in stages from the 1160s through to the 1240s, when the full usage of the church was finally secured uh, by the priory. Shortly afterwards, Bishop de Burnham rededicated the church to St. John the Baptist, although the old dedication to St. Drosson continued in Paro until the 19th century. This high status Macduff provenance means, I think, that we can legit legitimately compare the building to English, Irish, and I think even Norman examples, rather than having to rely solely on Scottish comparators as we have up until the present day. It's part of a wider Anglo-Norman uh, wave that spread rapidly from Norman, Normandy to, to Orkney. So the construction. Sadly, there's no time today to take you on a tour around the many similar 12th and 11th century buildings in Britain and beyond. And I'm certainly no art historian. 
So to our topic, our first topic, the construction of the tower. Are there any clues? As already noted, it's remarkably well preserved and of very high quality, uh, almost military in its execution. Despite this, the foundations are very shallow. The tower began to lean to the south in the early stages of construction. Now compare the angle of the vertical door here inserted in the 18th century with a lower plinth dipping down to the right. However, this was skillfully corrected by the time the walls were about three meters high. The tower, the tower may even have been built upon an augmented mound, and this may well be a, a sand quarry where, the, uh, where, the, where the, the sand was extracted. It's certainly the case that uh, in the early medieval period, a lot of sand was being shifted for a range of purposes, and this is uh, Maiden Castle at the other side of the, the, the Shire. <coughs> We had thought that this small elevated door related to the defence of the tower, as at Abernethy, but once we carefully removed the early 20th century cement from inside the tower, and we did get the opportunity occasionally to remove something from the existing building, um, we, once, uh, we, we, we found a blocked doorway, proving that the original access to the stair was internal and at ground level. This is probably also an 18th century insertion, and it is unlikely that the original tower had any door at ground level at all. Sole access being through this massive tower arch that was revealed when we removed uh, rotting timber from the ceiling. The frieze and imposts had been carefully uh, chiselled off sometime in the tower's history. Now, building of the upper stages probably involved very substantial beams passing right through the tower, providing both internal and external scaffolding. And you can see where these beams pass through from this, this image. In addition, two large directly opposing slots on the ground floor just above head height are currently being interpreted as the remains or remnants of a, the spindle of a, a, a lifting wheel of, of, of some description. And you can see some of the uh, medieval drawings of these lifting wheels uh, here. Um, it would have been dismantled and moved up the, the tower as the build, building progressed, hence the need for an internal as well as an external scaffolding platform. Unlike St. Rules, there are no buttresses in Mark Inch Tower other than the nave gable, and the building's strength comes from the disciplined cutting and setting of stone blocks in half-bonded fashion, a bit like a brick wall. Um, it was obviously something that was unusual at the time. Now, two pieces of graffiti uh, may shed light on the construction process. Now, these were found along with 800 mason's marks, am I right, that thereby uh, Moira, uh, meticulously recorded by Moira and the, the team of volunteers. Um, uh, the first uh, mark here we see is at ground floor level, and to me is clearly an instruction on the half-bonding technique. As you can see when the design is superimposed, on, 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 on the wall. Now the second and the top story, perhaps slightly more um, controversial, to me looks like a rough sketch of a weighted beam crane alongside several roof trusses. But Boyra and I have had correspondence on this and possibly it's a mason's hammer, you can take your pick. Certainly some form of crane would have been needed and it would have been linked to the winching system. The changing uh, pattern of Mason's marks and other building clues enable us to make a stab at how long it took to construct. Now, I would reckon uh, the foundations were laid, uh, once the foundations were laid, the tower would have been completed fairly rapidly in three or four seasons. We have less evidence for the nave and chancel, although we could hypothesise that the old church served as a chancel while the nave and tower were built. It may have been later in the 12th century when the old building was demolished and the eastern chancel wall that we see today was built. 
Now, excavation will be needed at the east end of the chancel at some point if we're going to pin down this, this date more, more, more clearly, or the sequencing more clearly. To me, the collection of Mason's marks is extraordinary and statistically quite different from samples collected at Delmeny, Dunfermline, and Lucas. Now, I know that many archaeologists have given up trying to make sense of Mason's marks, but I would urge them to look more carefully and perhaps develop a methodology uh, that would assist in the understanding of the, the, the building itself. Um, uh, as an example, Moira and I found a mark that I, I think is as uh, unique as a fingerprint when you take the background tooling uh, in, in, into consideration as well as the um, the mark itself. It's also worth noting that the tower and nave were built together as one interlocking unit with a nave uh, with nave thack stones projecting from the tower. The roof seems to be made from mudstone slabs found uh, later uh, reused uh, on, on, on later walling. I'll turn now to our attempts to reconstruct the inside and outside of the nave and chancel. Now, our first clues came from inside the attic of the present church and the raggle marks against the, 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 the tower. Thanks to some good survey work by Dr. Marie Claire Semple, we were able to map out the vertical profile of the original building plus two later uh, profiles. These indicated that the nave was widened first to the south and then to the north. Uh, with a bit of trigonometry, and, th and this is sheer indulgence for you in this slide, uh, we were able to estimate the width of the 12th century uh, nave, uh, 25 feet, and this was confirmed by external observation and by Dr. Oliver O'Grady's ground pen penetrating radar. O Oliver was very important in, in, in this exercise. There he is. Both the eastern chancel gable wall and the western nave were intact but, but disguised by later masonry. A chance find of a carved hood moulding during the work on the tower enabled us to get a good impression of the chancel arch. The arch would have been impressively large at over 17 feet with a, a star or saltire motif matching several reused sections embedded in the post-Reformation south wall. Um, this is significantly wider than the tower arch. On the nave side, uh, only a couple of square feet of panelling has been removed so far right at the top of the arch. It revealed this crapate, which I currently interpret as a mason's mark. That seems once they've been covered over in white plaster. Uh, this cross was probably not meant to be seen and would have been cut by a senior mason as a symbolic gesture when the arch was finished. A door opening into the upper part of the nave is a bit of a mystery and we'll skip the uh, possibilities there as, as time is running out. As for what the building looked like uh, on the inside, we have virtually nothing to guide us except for a small patch of white plaster, uh, still to be examined in detail, but hopefully more will be revealed later. Now, possibly this is the point at which I should sit down because it says dating here, but I'll have a, have a go. Very much a work in progress and will depend upon input from a number of different um, approaches and disciplines. Most of the, the evidence at the moment is, is coming from history and documentary analysis. It's proving very difficult to construct the hypothesis around the late 12th or early 13th century uh, period. It, it just doesn't stack up, so we're having to go earlier than that. We're having to go earlier than 1166 when the donation was made, and we're looking at the possibility of a, a Macduff clan chief, Aeth, um, possibly the 1150s, possibly Duncan I in the second quarter of the um, 12th century. But um, the donors of the 1160s may have traced their rights in the building back to Constantine Macduff, who 
flourished in the first quarter of the, um, the, the 12th century and probably has strong links to the Anglo-Norman world through his proximity to the Scottish royal family. We could put forward the hypothesis that Constantine fought alongside Alexander in his Welsh campaigns around 1114 and Mark Inch was built probably not, after, not long after Schoon Priory. Perhaps the architectural link was through Alexander's sister, Matilda of Scotland, a renowned builder herself and wife of Henry I of England, who would place the building between 1114 and 1125. It would be very interesting if the dating of a tower in Mark Inch depended upon a woman builder from Dunfermline, who by the way was called Edith when she lived in Dunfermline, not Matilda. There's also a case for seeing St. Rules as a riposte to Mark Inch by a powerful Bishop of St. Andrews rather than the traditional view of Mark Inch being a smaller scale copy. Competitive building based upon male psychology, I did say psychology would crop up, may in fact be the driving force. St. Rules is superlative to Mark Inch in so many dimensions, but not necessarily in building quality. Now, carbon dating has been attempted at Mark Inch using charcoal from within the walls, and thanks to Mike Cressy for help on this, but has so far been unsuccessful. But there's a lot of charcoal still accessible inside the walls where they've been cut through. A recently discovered timber at the top of the tower may yield to dendrochronology. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. So, last slide. Dating a building based upon design is very difficult. Much depends upon the resources and contacts of the patron. Architectural trends do not progress slowly from south to north. So far, none of the decoration found at Mark Inch would be out of place in a high-status building of the early 1100s, somewhere in the Anglo-Norman world. No flamboyant uh, chevron carving has been found, indicative of a mid or late 12th century high status building. It's almost certain that the antiquarian who, who preserved the simple chip carved hood moulding that we saw earlier would have kept a section of highly decorated stonework had it existed. So as regards dating, the early 12th century hypothesis currently seems strongest. But beyond that, the jury is still out. And we look forward to continuing the project next year. We're we have only recently secured permission to take off another piece of plaster from directly in front of the capitals of the tower arch, this time inside the, the, the nave. So we're looking forward to uh, what is revealed uh, underneath the 19th century uh, plaster. So watch this space. Thank you.